Good afternoon. Now you guys look sleepy today. I bet some of you are on the same flight with me in the morning at 5 o'clock. Um, you know, you are, I think it's the first time I've been in a room with people who know only one sign, which is to multiply. And uh, it's good to have all of you here. You know, when I was um, about eight years old, I followed my father on one of his many journeys into the Sikkim Himalayas. And before you knew it, you know, I was standing on top of the small mountain about 18,000 feet. You know, 18,000 feet is small in the Himalayas. You know, I don't know how big the mountains are where you guys are from. And um, it was during this time I realized that I wanted to climb more mountains and I ultimately wanted to aspire to climb Everest because my father climbed it and I looked up to my father as my greatest role model. He was my hero and I wanted to become just like him. I'd like to take you on a journey to the top of the world and to share with you what I learned while following my father's footsteps. My father, Tenzing Norge Sherpa, along with Sir Edmund Hillary, became the first humans to reach the highest point on earth, the summit of Mount Everest. Until then, 18 people died trying to climb this mountain and none had made it. It was only a couple years ago I learned what was not known outside the Buddhist monasteries and that is that in the beginning of the last century, a high Himalayan priest had made a prophecy that a Himalayan Buddhist would be the first to climb Chomolongma. Of course, uh, we Sherpas believe in the figurative. You know, this mountain changed my life forever too and also the lives of the Sherpa people. The worst disaster in the mountain's history occurred in the spring of 1996 where a total of 14 climbers died. It was during this time I learned a lesson in life, death, the value of Buddhism, reconnecting with my Sherpa roots, and most importantly, reconnecting with my father. I even asked my father to pull some strings so I can join an expedition to climb Everest, and he flatly said no. He said he climbed so that we wouldn't have to. Of course, I was a little older when I had the talk with him. But it was during this time, he wanted to give us the best education so we can continue our lives and some other careers rather than climbing because climbing was dangerous. Well, after living in the U.S. for almost 10 years, I decided to move back to pursue my dream to climb this mountain. I was born and raised in Darjeeling. My father moved here in 1932 when he was just 18 years old to pursue his dream. I'm sure some of you have had Darjeeling tea. Well, this is where the tea comes from. And this is basically what I see from my bedroom window every morning when it's clear. A lot different from what I see from my room window out here. Well, you know, in the winter of 1995, at, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call from David Brashears, a very well-known professional climber and a filmmaker. And uh, because of the American, you know, the time change, he called me here and uh, 2 in the morning, he said, Jamling, I want you to join the IMAX team as the uh, climbing leader. We have all the funds and we're all ready to go on this expedition. And I immediately said yes, because this is the opportunity I've been waiting for all my life. And my wife right next to me, you know, she gave me a very dirty look. She just told me, you know, that you don't decide at 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, on your own to go and climb Everest. You know, we need to sit down and talk. So, um, but I decided to go anyway. You know, but before going up, I had to seek a divination a, from my family priest. And his divination was not very favorable. He even mentioned that there would be some deaths on the mountain that year. And I was really determined to go on this climb. So I decided to seek a second opinion from my wife's family priest. And his divination was slightly more favorable, but said that we had to perform some religious ceremonies, you know, some pujas before heading up on this mountain. One of which was where I had sponsored a lighting of 25,000 butter lamps at the great stupa of Baudanath in Kathmandu. Well, our expedition started in Kathmandu. We started filming here for almost about a week to 10 days with uh, the guy in the white there is our producer, and uh, David Brashears, he's the one wearing the red. Not this guy over here, but uh, this one back over there. And um, we did some sh filming here, and then we headed up to the mountains after about uh, 10 days or so. So we went to a place called Lukla. We flew in this helicopter to a place called Lukla at 9,600 feet. And from this point, we were gonna have to walk for 10 days to get to the base camp of this mountain. 
The equipment you see here, this is one third of the climbing equipment only. I mean the filming equipment only. We had over two tons of gear that needed to go up on this mountain. In 1953, when my father and Hillary went, they had to walk all the way from Kathmandu to base camp, which took them almost about a month. We had over two tons of gear, and equipment has changed a lot these days. You know, it's become a lot, if you can see, it's become a lot more colorful and prettier today. At about 11,600 feet, we arrived at the biggest Sherpa village. It's called Namche Bazaar. And the word Sherpa means Eastern people. Sherpas migrated from Eastern Tibet almost about 500 years ago, crossed the high Himalayan passes and settled in the foothills of the Himalayas on the Nepalese side. Most Sherpas are farmers, and the only farming you can do above 12,000 feet is to grow potatoes. So we are very good at making anything you want out of potatoes. And a lot of the Sherpas are traders. They traded through the Nangpala Pass into Tibet. That's what my father did as a young, young boy. And a number of Sherpas today are climbers. Climbers not necessarily by choice, but climbers because it's a way of living for them. And besides having lived at this altitude for so many generations, we're able to adapt better and climb faster than most of the human beings. It's even believed that Sherpas have bigger lungs than other people. You know, Sherpas have benefited greatly from the trekking and tourism industry. Gone are the days when a Sherpa's wealth was measured by the number of yaks they had. You know, today is measured by the number of sleeping bags or down jackets they have. But uh, people say that we've become very commercialized, but we've taken in the best of the West, and we continue to maintain our cultures and traditions by continuing to do paintings on canvases of gods and goddesses, and we continue to worship our mountains each and every year. We even put up prayer flags along the way, and the prayer flags are called Lung Ta, which translates as wind horse. Horses being the messengers of gods, we put these prayer flags on bridges and high passes, hoping that uh, the prayers would be carried to the gods by the winds. And we believe, not only the Buddhists, but I'm sure the Hindus also believe that, you know, there are many, many sacred power spots in the Himalayas. And we also believe that local deities reside within some of these rocks. So we have carvings and paintings of gods and goddesses and prayers written on them. So people can pay their respect when they go from one village to the other. But at about 16,000 feet where I am at this place, we called it the Nupse Sheraton Hotel. Not much of a hotel, but uh, a nice fire inside, you know, curled up in a sleeping bag, sipping a cup of tea or soup, you know, certainly beats being out in the tent by yourself. You know, in 96, we had over 200 yaks that carried our supplies to base camp. And in 1953, during my father's time, they had over 500 porters that carried the supplies and they were kept two days apart, broken in, you know, half groups of two and then kept two days apart because there would be too many people, you know, walking on the trail in one day. And they had 15 people carrying these boxes full of money, you know, to pay all these 500 porters for the, for the one month. And then they had two people guarding each one of these 15 people to make sure that they did not run away with the money. Well, at 17,600, we arrived at base camp. This is going to be our home for the next two months. And base camp is basically on this huge glacier, which is all ice and is con constantly moving all the, all the time. And uh, the particular spot right in the middle here, the white spot, that's known as the treacherous Kumbu Icefall. And the Kumbu Icefall is basically a huge river of ice boulders that keep moving constantly each and every day. And about 60 people have died in the ice fall alone so far on this mountain. Well, I'll just introduce you to the team over here. Right on the left is our, our fearless leader, David Brashear from Boston. He had climbed Everest twice before. He was a cameraman, director, and he was the big boss. In the center is Araceli Cigarra from Spain. And if she climbed this mountain, she would be the first Spanish woman to do so. And then right over here is uh, Ed Beasters from Seattle. He had climbed Everest three times earlier, and this time he was going to try to climb it without any bottled oxygen. And we had uh, Sumio Suzuki from Japan, and she would be the second Japanese woman to climb this mountain if she did make it. And then we had Robert Schauer from Austria. Robert was the assistant cameraman. He was there to help David Brashears, and he was there to replace Brashears, continue the job in case something happened to David. And you can see him uh, treating one of the Sherpas for minor frostbite. 
And then we had a team of 20, over 20 Sherpas that was going to make this possible. You know, even though it's a job for the Sherpas to be up here, they're always laughing, joking, smiling, dancing around. And if you ask them to carry some supplies to a higher camp, they do it without even thinking twice. And they're basically the backbone on the mountains. They're the unsung heroes. And they risk their lives a lot more than anybody else to make sure that they get their clients to the top of the world. But before we started our climb, we held a religious ceremony, a puja, puja ceremony. And we did this basically to ask the gods to grant us safe passage on the mountain. We even built small altars to get all our equipment blessed before going on the climb. Well, the goddess that we prayed to was Mio Lang Sangma. She is the mother goddess of Everest, and she is the deity of inexhaustible giving. And we also prayed to her to keep us away from avalanches, which occurred every single day. You just had to make sure you were not there when it happened. And about 40 people have lost their lives in avalanches alone on this mountain. Well, you can see a few people walking through the icefall. It's a big, very, very large icefall. And some of the boulders are about 100, 200 feet tall. Some of the crevices are so deep that you don't even see the bottom of it. And our Sherpas, you know, they say that if you fall in a crevice, you will fall all the way to America without a visa. Well, we went up what is known as the most, we call this area the mouse trap because we didn't know when the surak below us was going to break us and we had no idea when the chunk above us was going to fall down either. So we had to literally run through some of these spots at high altitudes. And we used over 60, 60, 60 ladders on this first section of the climb alone. And all the ladders were put up by a team of Sherpas, we call them the icefall doctors. So every morning, a few Sherpas would go through the icefall. Early morning means midnight. You know, they'd go right through the icefall to make sure the route was safe. And if it wasn't, their job was to fix it. And then following early, later on that morning, maybe at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, the rest of the, all the other members would go up through the icefall. In 1953, my father and Hillary, they ran out of the aluminum ladders, the little bit they brought. So they used logs. Now trees don't grow above 12,000 feet. So they had to cut these trees at the low elevation, shave them off, carry these logs all the way up, and then they had to carry these logs through the ice fall, and then finally they had to balance on these logs to get across these crevices. So you can imagine how difficult it was climbing 60 years ago. You know, we even lowered our fearless leader into the crevices sometimes, so he could film some of us walking, you know, across those ladders. And sometimes we felt like just leaving him there. You know, we went up what is known as the classic route. And this is the route that was taken by my father and Hillary in 1953. And previously in 52, my father had gone with the Swiss also on the same route. And if a person were to go from base camp, <clears throat> whether it's you, me, or the best climbers in the world, the fittest person in the world, were to go from base camp to camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four, every day, that person would be unconscious in camp two within a few hours and then dead soon thereafter. And one of the reasons is you have to acclimatize an altitude. You have to take steps, you have to go up slowly, come down, go up and come down. So we've gone up and down this mountain many, many times. So we had gone up and, mount, up and down this mountain many times, and that's one of the reasons it takes us almost two months to climb a big mountain like this. So this particular area right up here, in the, right that notch over there, that is known as the South Call, which is at 26,000 feet. And uh, there's only one third of the oxygen that you have down here at sea level. And this area is also known as the death zone, because many, many people cannot survive beyond this point without uh, bottled oxygen. Well, equipment has changed a great deal since uh, 60 years ago. Today, uh, those days, they had a lot of canvas, a lot of wool, khaki, very, very heavy materials. And um, they had to cut steps all the way on the ice. They had to cut steps all the way to the top. Because, you know, the crampons, the spikes we have on the boots, they were all facing down. 
So somebody came up with a bright idea a few years later, down the line, maybe 10 years later, that to put two more points in the front. So after that, we don't have to cut steps anymore. We go front pointing, which makes it a lot more easier for us. When about 24,000 feet, you're basically above the clouds. All the mountains you thought were big start to disappear down way down below you. And then at this point, you start to feel the lack of oxygen. Everything you do takes twice the effort. You know, taking a few steps, you breathe a lot heavier, and you're always resting, and you're very, very tired. And you boil water, it takes, you know, I don't know, 10 more times, 10 times, it would take down your sea level. So it starts, your, uh, the mountain starts taking toll on your body at this point. And at this particular point from Camp 3, we saw a whole line of climbers going up the mountain towards the high camp and for the summit. So our team, our filming team, we decided we were going to come down and wait at the lower camp because firstly, there were too many climbers up there on the mountain. There were a lot of inexperienced climbers and the weather was not looking too good also. And for filming purposes, we did not feel it was right. So we decided we were going to come down and wait until these people went up to the top and came back down. Well, one of the first incidents that occurred during this climb was when this Taiwanese climber, he went to relieve himself at Camp 3, which is very, very steep. He slipped and he fell in a crevice about 60 feet deep. So our Sherpas were there, they pulled him out of the crevice and then they started to walk him down. And just about halfway down, he died. So the Sherpas left his body there and came down the mountain because we believe that when a person dies an untimely death, the soul is not at rest and it's a bad omen to touch the spirited body before going to climb. So our teammates, David Bashir and some other, other climbers, they had to go up and retrieve this dead climber down the mountain, which is not something people really appreciate doing before going on a big climb. Well, on this particular day, the 10th of May, nine people died that night, high up above the death zone. And it was during this time, we put on all the camera gear. The next morning, we put together a rescue team to go up the mountain, all the way up as high as possible to bring back the survivors. There were almost about two dozen survivors still stranded high up on the mountain. So we put on everything and then we headed up the mountain to different sections of the mountain to help to bring back all these survivors back down the mountain, including back weathers. I don't know if you've heard of this guy, but he was left for dead at the South Pole for almost 24 hours. People thought he was dead, so they left him there. And then he miraculously, after 24 hours, spending, you know, uh, no sleeping bag, no tent, nothing, just out on his own at minus 30, 40 degrees temperatures, he survived that night, and he miraculously started to crawl towards his tent. And he said to himself, I remember him telling us this later on, that he said to himself that no matter what happens, you know, whether I walk off the face of, of this mountain or whether I get to the tent over there, I'm going to crawl until I can walk no more or crawl no more. And we had to literally, literally carry him down this mountain because his legs was frozen, hands, face, mouth, everything. He was basically like a statue over there. So we had to literally carry him down. We brought him down to Camp 2 and organized another rescue the next day to bring everybody off the mountain, including the dead climber who was wrapped in the sleeping bag over there. So the next day, when we reached base camp, we had a memorial service for all the climbers that had died. It was a very sad day. Overall, 14 climbers died that season. And a few of those climbers were good friends of mine, climbing partners of mine who, were, who I had climbed with before. It was very sad to see that, you know, there was nothing we could do to help those guys. But one of the reasons was that there were too many climbers on the mountain that day. There were a lot of inexperienced climbers, bad weather, bad judgment, and they were up on the mountain too late. You know, we Sherpas believe that pride and arrogance disrespect to the mountain, defiling the mountain can also anger the gods and cause such things to happen. Well, the next day, everybody packed up and left to go back home, except for us. Because I believe that astrological conditions can change. So I called my wife in Kathmandu again and asked her to seek another divination from her wife's family priest. And the next morning I got a call from her saying that the divination was very favorable, we were going to have good weather and our chances of success was very high. So I immediately hung up the phone without even thanking her to give the great news to my teammates and to the Sherpas. And immediately on hearing that, they said, all right, let's go up. We said, let's go up and try this, climb this mountain one more time. Despite knowing the fact that we were going to meet, you know, we we're going to come across a 
few of our friends who are still lying up there, you know, who we were not able to help. But we put our, all our differences aside, set our courages together, and we said, let's go up and take care of this. Let's go and climb this mountain, let's go and film, and let's do what we can to our best ability. So we headed up this mountain one last time, up through the ice fall. We had been up, we go up and down the ice fall over a dozen times, and this is the last time we were going to go up through the ice fall. And to give you an example of the movement in the ice fall, this crevice here was only two feet wide when we started the climb. In the six week period of time, it had opened to over 30 feet wide. So there's always constant movement and you have to be very, very careful on the ice fall because people say that ice fall moves and it can eat you up and basically it does and it has already you know, taken 60 lives so far. And then we continued going up to the yellow band. It's a very little more tricky area because uh, it's mainly rock and ice. So with the rock uh, on the crampons, it's very tricky. So it's almost like asking you to roll a blade on an ice ring. So we try to negotiate this as quickly and as carefully as possible. And just about, you know, we got about half the way up there. And our fearless leader decided this is a really nice place to shoot a roll of film. You know how these movie directors, they go with the, with the hands, they go like this, you know, and they go, oh, nice shot, you know, and then they put the camera there and then they do the shoot. So we had no choice but to tie up everything safely, put the camera up there, and we shot one roll of film. We wasted about two hours at this point at the most dangerous area. And at the end, he, this guy, he never even used a single clip from this from the shot. <laughs> well, at about 26,000 feet, the death zone at the South Pole, when my father and Hillary got to the same spot in 1953, this is what they saw. This is the remains that was left here by my father and his Swiss climbing partner that were on this mountain one year ago, twice. And that was the year my father had reached 400 feet from the summit and had to turn back because of bad weather. Well, in 1996, when we got to the same spot, this is what we saw. There were over a thousand empty bottles of oxygen, rubbish of all kinds, tent, bowls, parts, and by the time we got there, there were over a do half a dozen dead bodies scattered around this area. It's not a very nice place to be on a beautiful mountain like this. But um, today, this mountain is a lot more cleaner. I have personally been on two cleanup expeditions, raised enough funds from different companies to clean up this mountain, and we were able to bring back almost over 800, 800 empty bottles and over two tons of rubbish down this mountain. Well, the South Pole, this is my father, called this area, is just like being in the moon. This place is very, very windy. You can blow tents away. I've seen tents being blown away in this area. You have to tie yourself to the rocks. And uh, we went to sleep. By 3 o'clock, we went to sleep because at midnight, we we're going to start walking. And when we start walking at midnight, we're going to have to go all the way to the top. And it is going to take us a minimum of 12 hours to get from this camp to the summit and then you need time to come back down also. So that's why we leave at midnight and climb at night so we can get there by one and come back by five, six o'clock in the evening. So we went to sleep, got up at about 10 o'clock, got something to eat, put on our oxygen mask, headlamps on, you know, a little thermos of tea, some chocolate, some candies for the, you know, for the way, and then we had started heading up this mountain. And in the dark, you know, just the headlamps on, there are climbers in front and behind you, but you don't notice who is where and who is who because you're concentrating on yourself to make sure that you do not make any mistakes. Because if you make a mistake here, you're going down this mountain yourself. So as the sun was rising, we realized that, you know, most of the clouds were way down below us and you can see the shadow of Everest. And uh, this means that we're going to have good weather and good weather means chances of success is very, very high. So this particular moment, you know, I thought about my father a lot. What was this man thinking about? You know, he tried to climb this mountain six times before, since he was 18 years old. He never gave up. Six times he tried, and finally on the seventh attempt, he finally made it. And he was very determined, he was very passionate about what he did, and he never gave up his will, you know, to truly do what he wanted to do all his life. And at this particular point also, I felt very, very strong. I had so much energy, just so much energy in me, I felt maybe it was him watching over, giving me this extra energy to climb this mountain. Well, at the balcony, this area I call the balcony at 27,500 feet, this is the same spot my father and Hillary slept one night before climbing to the summit in 1953. 
Now you can imagine a beekeeper from New Zealand and a Sherpa from India. My father hardly spoke any English and Hillary did not speak any Hindi, Nepali, Sherpa, none of those languages. Now you can imagine two people at 27,500 feet, two soul people up there sleeping at night with minus 60 degree temperatures, winds blowing and uh, not talking to each other, you know, as if they just got in a big fight like husband and wives. And uh, the next day they were going to go and create history. And I think it just goes to show you that you know, no matter what geographic locations you're from, what ethnic backgrounds you're from, what interests you have, as long as you're passionate about what you want to do and you do it together as a team, nothing else matters in accomplishing your goals. But in 96, when we got to the same spot, you know, Araceli and my, uh, myself, we just finally like really tired, we finally got up to this spot, we were resting, we were sucking as much oxygen, we were just sitting down to rest for a, you know, a few minutes. And uh, David Bishers had set up the camera up there already. And uh, as soon as we sat down, David looked at us and said, Okay, Araceli and Jamling, why don't you guys go back down 50 feet? And we looked at him in surprise because at 27,500 feet, you don't ask anybody to go down 50 feet, you know. We've come up all the way and uh, we had no choice but to do it. So we went down 50 feet, turned around, and he wanted us to walk at the spot where no one had walked before because he didn't want any footprints. And nobody had any business going there because it's a very, very steep and sharp ridge. So we went down, turned around, and we had a slate. He had a slate, a slate and he said, action! So we started walking up slowly and he was rolling the film. And as we got about halfway up, he said, cut, you know, go back and do it again. Well, we had no choice but to do it. And I'm glad we did because this is the shot that he was looking for. And if you realize why we had no business being there, it was because there was a 9,000 feet drop off on the other side straight into Tibet. Well, climbing on the mountain, you know, the higher you go, the slower you get. You take one, two, three, four steps, and then you breathe, and you breathe, you suck in as much air as possible, you know, you're like really tired, your lungs are working really hard, and then again you take a few more steps, and then you breathe really hard, rest for a while, and you just putting one foot in front of the other becomes a chore. You know, at this point you just keep saying to yourself, you know, why the hell am I doing this thing? But it is not only the physical challenge that gets you on these mountains, you have to be mentally prepared. Because if you're not mentally prepared, you will not even get through the first session of the climb, which is the ice fall. And at about 28,500 feet, we're almost getting there. This is known as the South Summit. And this is a safe place to be waiting. We waited here another hour to do some more filming. But it was not particularly a very nice place because if you look in the corner right over the small red dot, that is Rob Hall, one of the New Zealand climbing guides, a good friend of mine. He was lying frozen in the corner over there. There was nothing we could do to help him because he was two days away. And this is the last place he had called his wife from here in New Zealand and talked to his wife who was six months pregnant at the time with the first child. And um, the last phone call he had that evening, you know, and then went to sleep and he never woke up again. So it was very sad to see him there, but there was nothing we, we could do to help. So we continued our filming and then we walked through here, walked past him. And we took it as a reminder to be careful not to end up like him. Because you know, we were not going to make our last phone calls from here either. So we very, very cautiously, you know, s slowly, carefully, we headed up the final summit ridge. And the summit ridge is very, very steep and sharp. You know, some of the places there's just enough room to put one foot at a time. And uh, you also had a choice whether you want to go to Nepal or Tibet. 8,000 feet on either side. And uh, quite a few people have taken that, you know, they've fallen off from the mountain up, up higher up, up here. Well, the mountain hasn't changed much, you know, we've changed. Human beings have changed, our attitudes have changed. And as far as the climbing world is concerned, I think not really for the better. On this particular time, you know, the last final stretch of the climb, Araceli Sigara, you know, my uh, Spanish friend, she kept asking me in a, friend, in a friendly Spanish accent, she kept saying, Jamling, Jamling, how long, you know, how much more longer, when do you think we're going to get there? And she went on and on and on for a while. And then after a while, I just sort of, you know, got fed up. So I took out my mask and I said, you know, Araceli, I don't know how far it is, how long it's going to take, you know, because I've never been here before. And I'm sure it's there close by somewhere. And before we knew it, you know, it was less than 50, 50 feet away. And Araceli Sigara became the first Spanish woman to reach the summit of Everest. 
extremely strong climber, very passionate about what she does, and an excellent climbing partner to have. Well, I felt proud to be standing on the same spot my father once stood 46 years ago at that time. I even tried to take a picture just like him. You know, but if you notice, I have my wrong hand up, and I don't have any plans to go back again. Now, when I reached the summit, I cried out of joy. I thanked, hugged David Peshers, and I thanked him for giving me the opportunity of a lifetime. And I put up prayer flags uh, for the mother goddess, Shumulongma, and I thanked her for getting us up the mountain, and I asked her to bring us down this mountain safely also. You know, as Ed Beister is one of my climbing members, he says that climbing a mountain is optional. Getting down is mandatory. People forget that. So I reached up there. I put up, some, uh, put up my picture of my late father and my late mother. And, um, you know, before my father had gone to climb in 1953, my stepsister had given him some candy and told my father that if you ever get to the summit, please leave these as an offering to the gods. So when he got to the top, he did exactly that. He left those sweets as an offering to the gods. So I thought it would be nice to do the same thing with my daughter, who was 10 months old. So I left a little rattle elephant that belonged to my 10-month-old daughter. The only difference was she didn't give it to me, you know, I had to take it from her. Well, we finally got the camera to the top of the world. The IMAX camera, we named, nicknamed it the pig, because it was so heavy that nobody wanted to carry it. You know, the camera, the body alone, weighed 44 pounds, which is about 20 kilos. One roll of film weighed about 4 kilos, and a roll of film, when you open the film out, it was about 1,000 feet long. And when you played the film, it lasted only 90 seconds. So the amount of film that we had to carry on this mountain and do takes after takes was a lot of time consuming and very, very problematic. So we finally got the camera to the top. We had 10 Sherpas that carried the camera equipment to the last camp and five Sherpas who carried the camera all the way to the summit. So we got the camera here and it, the film had to be loaded bare hands, we had gloves off. So David Bisher has practiced a lot, very fast, very fast. So he got up there and opened his gloves and they started, you know, feeding the film in the camera. The temperature here right now is about minus 60 degrees. Mm. You know, when you fly in your plane, when you go from Delhi, Mumbai, wherever, the captain tells you, right? The outside temperature is minus 50 degrees. Well, it's 10 degrees more colder up here. So, got the camera loaded up and we crossed our fingers and said, God, hope this thing works. You know, because if it didn't, we're going to throw the damn thing off the mountain anyway. But we were very, very lucky that all 90 seconds of it came out beautifully. So after spending almost two hours on the summit, we decided it was time to head back down the mountain. So it took us, an, it took us another four to five days to get back down to base camp because we had additional filming to do on the way down. So when you get back to base camp, you, know, you can say that you've climbed this mountain safely and successfully. It's nice to be home at base camp to greet all the supporters and all your team members and to celebrate your accomplishment. You know, but before leaving to go back home, I turned back to Chomolongma one last time and I thanked her for getting us the success you know, and for bringing us up and down this mountain safely. And I made a vow at this time to help to give back to the community, to the people that, to the Sherpa people and the people that lived in the shoulders of the Himalayas. You know, climbing with right motivation, climbing with respect, respecting the culture, the environment, the people, the mountain, and working together as a team is what I learned while following my father's footsteps. You know, mountaineering is a tough adventure. It's just like working in a corporation. You, know, you never know what's around the corner. You know, it is important to have a sense of commitment to each other and self-reliance to the group. You know, the foundation for achieving success in any goal must be driven by an inner desire and passion. You know, getting to the top of this mountain was not the end of my goal. It was just the beginning. We have to set ourselves to new challenges and not be afraid to dream of new ideas because it's the next challenge that motivates and inspires us. You know, it is important to be a good citizen and team players, but above all, you need to be passionate and you need to have the drive to achieve, you know, you have the burning desire to achieve your goals. I'd like to leave you with something my father always told me. He said, be a leader, be a guide, guide your clients and accomplish your goals despite the hardships. But above all, be great, make others great. Thank you.
thirty, but I think having Jamlin here deserves at least ten minutes of question and answers. So, if any of you have questions to ask him, then we can be happy to take them. Okay. Yeah, Shannon. Yes. Well, your two other teams went up from the base camp, right? Two other teams went up. Did you observe anything which, uh, you know, yes. as 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 the leader of a successful expedition, did you observe anything, any best practices that they did or did not follow? Well, I think the, one of the most important thing was that uh, our team, we were known as the dream team on the mountain that year. I mean, you could not have put a team of climbers together, you know, that, that we had, because we had a uh, mission to make the IMAX film, which most people, the climbing community and the filming community from Hollywood and everywhere, they said it's impossible, it's not going to be done. And uh, we were, the team was assembled so that we could accomplish this goal. And we did finally prove everyone else wrong by making the film you know, on the top. And I think one of the most important things was we had a great team. And the other teams, what was lacking in them was confidence, training. And uh, they were not you know, passionate about what they did. And that's one of the reasons there was a fallout in the team. Uh, people who should not have been on the mountain were up there. You know, no prior training was given because these were all commercial teams. Commercial expeditions, you know, charging sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars per person, you know, to go on these mountains, and you can still do that today. Yeah. Namita, can you speak into the mic, please? Can you hear me? Yes. They say that the mountain changes you. Do you feel this trip changed you, or brought in something, a kind of a change in you? Well, mountains do change people. You know, I think our, in this world, people try to change the mountains, you know. But it's just the opposite. They need to realize that nature has the ultimate say. And um, this mount climbing, not only I've been climbing since I was eight years old, I still continue to climb today. But climbing Everest was one of my most uh, valuable experiences that I learned. And one of the things that changed me was humbleness, you know, to respect nature. I continue to do that even today. It makes you feel how small and tiny we are in this planet. You know, we are at the mercy of nature. You cannot take nature for granted. So we try to protect nature so that we are protected as well. And when you're up on these mountains all the time, you're at a very vulnerable stage. Your chances of returning from any mountain is 50-50. No matter how experienced you are, the avalanche comes, if something happens, anything can happen on the mountain and, you know, uh, you cannot predict anything. And one of the, one of the uh, things that changed me a lot during this time was I learned a lot of patience on the mountain. You know, it was more, the climb for me on, the, on Everest was more of a pilgrimage. It was more like paying homage to my late father, you know, learning more about him, what he had done, what he had experienced, you know, by following, literally following in his footsteps. Because um, growing up, I did not get to know him as well as I wanted to as a father and son because we were in boarding school nine months and he was traveling all the time. And this climb gave me that chance to, you know, reconnect uh, with him. And fear set in. What do you think is the number one thing that probably helped you conquer fear? Well, see, uh, it is expect when you climb mountains, death is expected anytime, anywhere, with anybody. It can be you or your friend or your best friend or you know somebody else. And I think one of the things that when you go on climbs like these, you have to be focused and you have to be prepared to see these things and not, you know, uh, get scared or, you know, get psyched to, you know, uh, uh, not climb anymore because you've seen a dead person over there. And it's a very normal sight that we see. We have to get used to it and, you know, just train yourself that you have to, in your mind, you have to say that that is not what I want to become like later on. You know, at the end of the day, you just make sure that, you know, you don't want to be ending up like this person who is, you know, frozen over there. So that keeps you going all the time. Make no mistakes. Uh, uh, there are lots of other hands up, so I'm going to come back to you. Yeah, there was a... Yeah, go ahead, I'm going to come. You talked about uh, there was a bad day when there were a lot of deaths in, in the mountain. Uh, on that particular day, 
there would have been doubts in your team as well. So how did you keep the motivation high and proceed? See, our team, uh, we knew exactly what we were getting into. We knew each other very well. You know, we were a team of uh, international climbers. We were put together and we met for the first time in Kathmandu. We never knew each other. And only the leader knew each and every other team, all, all the members. I did not know any of the other team members. None of them knew, you know, each other either. So we were put together and met in Kathmandu for the first time. And uh, you can imagine that uh, being put together for the first time, you know, and having to accomplish this goal was a great feat for us. But we worked really well together because the leader, he chose the team well. You know, he knew no, no matter, even if you guys didn't talk to each other, didn't know each other, he knew that we were going to accomplish this goal and make it happen and make it possible. And I think that's one of the things that was lacking in all the other teams was that they did not know each other and they did not care for each other because they were up there just for one thing and one thing that was, it was ego related, you know. They were driven by ego, not by passion. And that's what led to the disaster on the mountains. And we continue to see that all the time. I think um, everything comes equally, you know, the training is very important, you need to be in good shape firstly, secondly, good fortune, you have to have luck on your side, and uh, just because you are a very lucky person doesn't mean you don't have to train, you know, you still have to train and stay fit, and decision making, making sure that you select the right team is very, very important, and that's one of the decisions that we made uh, while going on this climb, when, you know, all the other team members decided to go back. We decided we were going to continue to go up because we knew each other. We knew we could uh, rely on each other and we knew our strength, you know, what our strength was. And we knew that we could climb this mountain, you know, without any problems. When I got to the top? Yeah, that minute when you got to the top. Well, see, when you get to the top, I when I think about it all, I try to remember as much as, much as possible. You know, I don't know the state that I was in at the time because your adrenaline is rushed at the time. You know, you're up there, you've achieved everything, you've worked so hard, your know, lack of oxygen, you know, people are going to hypoxia, you know, hallucination is going on. You know, you don't know what's going on at the time. You're like so high, you know, as if you're like uh, really buzzed, you know, from this big rush. And uh, you don't really get to soak it in much, you know, as much as you wanted to. And uh, I think one of the reasons, one, one of the things I think I need to do is go back again, you know, to make sure that this time I really suck in everything and enjoy the moment up there. But again, uh, I cannot do that because I had to promise, promise my family, my wife, my family that I will never go back again on that mountain. Yeah, this is a perfect, I apologize for a very bad part. But once you get on top of Everest, isn't it all downhill from there? <laughs> so, I mean, how do you keep yourself motivated? I mean, once you scale Everest, you've done it all, right? I mean, there's nothing higher. So, how do you, after that, what are the goals you set and challenges you like this? Well, once you get to the top, like I said earlier, you know, climbing a mountain is optional, getting down is mandatory. A lot of people die on the way down. You know, climbing down is as dangerous because what happens is you've been climbing, training your whole you know, for the two months you've been climbing, concentrating, just climbing, climbing, gaining the strength, acclimatizing. And at altitude, you lose appetite, you lose weight, um, you don't sleep, you have insomnia, you don't sleep, you're hungry, you know, you're tired, you hallucinate, you know, you're hypoxic. So all these things are taking effect up there. And that's when people make the mistakes. They get to the top, they're really happy to take, take a photo, and then on the way down, they make mistakes, you know, silly mistakes. And um, so that is one of the things that getting down is, you know, even more challenging and you have to make sure that you get down more safely and soundly at the bottom of the climb. But getting to the top of the climbing Everest is a great thing. I've done it, you know. Um, you say, what, are, what do you do now? No, that's what your question was. What do you do next? Well, it's not the height always, you know. It's difficulties. It's exploration. You need to explore. I continue to climb other mountains, smaller mountains, beautiful mountains, uh, look for different routes of these mountains, 
You know, you just need to explore yourself. You need to go out and just try every time to find different avenues to keep your life, you know, going on and on. Very nice. Um, last question. Um, you know, you mentioned about the, the physical, the mental state of mind, and which is, if I can use the word, is not normal because you're tired and blah, blah, blah. Then you have a team of, from different geographies, and no matter how much you, you know, invest time to stand. In, in the whole process, there must have been situations of conflict among people, and considering that the mental state and the physical state is also not normal, is there anything you can share, like, you know, there was a conflict, and what helped you resolve that? Because at the end of the day, you know, mm -hmm. ultimately the team made it to the top. So, anything you want to share? Well, um, with us, our team, we did not have any conflict, you know. We worked really well. We uh, compromised each other, you know. We were working with each other. You had something to say, I'd say, okay. Then we worked together as a team. We circled up. We said, all right, what's the best decision? And the leader, you know, we would decide as a group. And the leader would say, all right, yeah, this is what we do. You know? But I've seen this conflict with a lot of other, other teams, you know, that have conflicts between the team members. And this year was, uh, I think, uh, disastrous here on Everest because there was a fight up there. You know, two, three Western climbers were fighting with the Sherpas. Five Sherpas went out to beat these climbers because they were, you know, climbing where they should not have been, you know, endangering their lives. So what has mountaineering come to today, you know? It has become a competitive place, you know, uh, for the Sherpas and for the Western climbers wanting to be, you know, wanting to be like a Sherpa themselves and trying to do alpine style climbing and doing different trains. So it, it brings a lot of problems. And I think this is one of the things that, you know, people need to understand. That's why I said earlier is, you, before you climb these mountains, you make sure, before you climb, you make sure why are you climbing this mountain? Is it because of the ego or is it because you're passionate about climbing it? And that is what differentiates the people on the mountain and anywhere else in the world. And I think what, like, uh, just to close this off, I, you know, what I do in my world, climbing mountains, you know, I'm a guide, I'm a leader, you know, taking groups, uh, people into hazardous domains and trying to make sure that I try to help to accomplish their goals. You know, being a guide, forcing, you know, uh, problems ahead of time, you know, working with the problems and coming up with solutions. And that's what you guys do, you know, being CFOs, you know, with your companies. You have, you know, as a leader, you need to guide your colleagues, you know, your company, people working under you to make sure that they, you know, achieve their goals. And uh, we are on the very similar level, you know, so maybe we can exchange, next time you can come and climb mountains with me, I'll come and sit in the office. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you.